Thanks everyone for joining us. I'm Jordan Rutter, Director of Public Relations at American Bird Conservancy. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel afterward. We'll be putting the links referenced in the chat, but in case you missed them or can't copy them down fast enough, please know that everything can be found in a follow-up email we'll send to registrants and on our website. Please submit any questions you have during the presentation using the Q&A box. We'll try to answer as many of those as we can during the Q&A portion at the end of the presentations. But we'll also be answering some of the questions in the Q&A box as we go to, so again, use it. Automated captions are available for this webinar and you can turn them on by clicking on the up arrow next to the CC icon, then clicking on show subtitles. And you can drag those wherever you want on the screen then. Before we begin, I wanted to share some background about American Bird Conservancy, shortened to ABC. It was founded in 1994 with the mission of protecting wild birds across the Americas. And we continue that work today following a conservation strategy outlined by the pyramid featured on the next slide. And our work strives to help keep common birds common and prevent the rarest species from going extinct. And bird conservation works. Individual species and groups of birds have rebounded in the past decades, but it doesn't happen without people like you who care about birds. So thank you again for joining our webinar today. And thank you especially since we are in the season of spring migration. Warblers and orioles, grosbeaks, buntings, and more are all returning for the breeding season. Their beautiful colors and wonderful songs are enticing and definitely make being inside a challenge right now. And there are a few things better than hearing a dawn chorus. It's my favorite bird sound because how could you pick one song? But with so many birds that each make so many different sounds, it can sometimes be overwhelming. Today's webinar is going to share some tips on how to learn and remember bird sounds. Whether you're new to birds or a seasoned birder that's rusty from not hearing those songs all winter like me, I hope this webinar is useful. And then we'll also learn about how bird songs are important information for current conservation efforts. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our speakers. A professional ornithologist, keynote speaker, and environmental consultant, John C. Robinson holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in biology from Iowa State University. A two-time number one best-selling author, he has published six books about nature and birds, including Tweet, Flutter, and Squawk, and Birding for Everyone, encouraging people of color to become bird watchers. John has also led professional birding and natural history tours all over the world. Jim Giacomo is American Bird Conservancy's Central Region Director. He holds a PhD in natural resources from the University of Tennessee, where he monitored and modeled productivity of Winslow sparrows, dick sissels, eastern meadowlarks, and other grassland birds. Jim was previously coordinator for the Oakston Prairie Joint Venture. And just this year, he received the Partners in Flight Leadership Award for his outstanding contributions to grassland conservation. We also have Gemma Radko helping to answer questions in that Q&A box I mentioned. And she's our communications and media manager here at ABC. She's also an ornithology teacher. John is going to start now. So we'll switch slides and take it away, John. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so we'll start off with birding essentials, enjoying and helping songbirds this spring. I wanna thank you again for that wonderful introduction and we'll get started here. So let's talk about some objectives for what we're gonna go over. Um, our objectives for today are to help you enjoy and appreciate songbirds this spring. And parts of my presentation will help you to fortify your connection with nature and simplify and or demystify the bird identification process. So that's what we'll be covering today. Plus, in addition, we'll be exploring a basic set of universal bird identification tools and scales, all focused on bird song. And we'll leave you with a way to achieve lifelong improvement in this core skill set. So let's get started. But first, we've got some breaking news. Right now, scattered among the pines, sycamores, and bald cypress swamps of the southeastern United States, there is a bird that whistles 
Bidi, 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 bidi. It's a song that descends in pitch, but can often trail upward at the end. And another website you know very well, American Bird Conservancy, they describe this as melodic and bouncy. The name of this bird is the yellow-throated warbler. And last week, it was American Bird Conservancy's Bird of the Week. Now, in this presentation, we'll be talking about how to recognize bird songs just like this one. So identifying birds by sound, it's part of a 10-step process that I have taught as part of an online course. And I cover it in more depth in my latest book, Tweet, Flutter, and Squawk, How to Identify Birds by Sight and by Sound. And it's actually the ninth step in my course. I consider this technique to be the best and probably the most important bird identification technique. And I think you'll be surprised at just how many birds can be identified on the basis of sound alone. Yet, it is one of the most difficult techniques to master. Now, that being said, once you've learned this technique, you can use it anywhere in the world. This is a photo of me in South Africa with my bird guide, David Nkosi. Uh, when we collaborated to co-lead our first tour there with Entaba Tours, David taught me many of the bird calls and songs of that country. And he was surprised by how many I remembered, such as this lilac breasted roller, when I returned to South Africa and lit another tour with him about eight months later. So keep in mind that when birds vocalize, they have two different basic ways to do that. They can do a song or they can give a call. Now, typically, the song is going to be the more longer or more complex vocalization that you hear birds give. Um, American Robin would be a great example of a song that almost all of us are familiar with. It's been on everyone's front lawn. Um, songs are usually used to defend a territory or perhaps for a male to attract a mate. And although most of us might be familiar with songs that say last several seconds, some species like the Henslow Sparrow, which is shown here, or the least flycatcher, they give a very, very short song. And even though it's very short, it's a very short vocalization, we still call them songs. So let's listen to an example of a very short song, this one being the Henslow Sparrow. So that bird just sings Fisik, and there it is. Now, um, when we go on and we look at, okay, now we're thinking about calls. Calls, on the other hand, are the vocalizations that a bird can make that are typically very short, very simple sounds, usually not as complex as a song. And they're there to serve a different purpose maybe to let other birds in the area know that a predator is near or that there's food in the area, or maybe to express aggression toward another bird. And since we're talking about songs and calls, the black-capped chickadee makes a great case study. This is a species where the call is often as long and sometimes even longer than the song. As an example, the namesake for the chickadee is that chickadee dee 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 and many people start out thinking, well, that's the song, but that's really its call. So let's listen now to the Phoebe song of the black capped chickadee. And then we get into the seasonal frequency. Some birds only sing during the breeding season. Whereas other birds like this white-throated sparrow can be found singing even in the middle of winter. Um, this was not uncommon for me to see white-throated sparrows singing in the middle of winter in the Midwest, but they even do, that, do it out here and on the coast of California where I live now, along with all the golden crown sparrows, which are really abundant out here. So we get to hear them sing in the winter. And speaking of that bird of the week, yeah. 
not only do we know that it sings in the spring, but it comes very early. It's one of the earliest arriving warblers. So you can actually hear it singing very early in the spring before most other warbler species have arrived. And you also know the habitat, sycamores, pines, bald cypress will be present. And all of these little details now make it easier to identify this particular species at this particular time of the year. And although typically the males sing, the females will sing as well. This is actually more common than we think. And some researchers estimate as many as 60% of songbird species worldwide have females that actually sing. Okay, so let's talk about non-vocal sounds. For example, there is the weno call of the Wilson snipe. And for many of the birds that we'll show on this screen, these birds are actually using their wings or their tail or maybe even their beak to actually create sounds. And they create those sounds to serve the same purpose that other birds achieve when they're vocalizing with a song or a call note, you know, to mark off a territory or to attract a mate or so forth. Now, my favorite is the noticeably irregular tapping sound made by the sapsucker species. And when you hear that irregular sound, you not only know that it's a woodpecker, but you know that it's a sapsucker, a specific type of woodpecker. In the east, yellow-bellied, out in the west, red-breasted, red-naped, or Williamson's. So non-vocal sounds, they can actually be a topic of a whole other course. And I encourage you to study this particular slide, apply it to some of the birds in your local area. For example, we as bird watchers, um, we often rely on non-vocal sounds to identify the various hummingbird species. Now, oftentimes people will ask me, well, how do I go about learning all these different bird songs. And over the last 12 years, I've talked about all of these methods that are listed here. And I've specifically emphasized multimedia programs, which allow you to look at the bird at the same time that you're hearing it. As another example, when you hear a bird sing, like the zo-z, zo -zo -z of the black-footed green warbler, that phrase, Zo z zo zo z, putting words to the song, that's what we call a mnemonic. And depending on when you were born, some of these images may be more relevant to you than some of the others, but let us not forget in the field experience. And one of the keys to in the field experience is that you get a sense of how often the bird is singing and calling and where it's singing and calling from, which you just can't get when you're listening to a recording in your living room. Now in the last day, uh, in the last 10 years, there's been a, a huge proliferation of online websites um, that can actually also help you learn bird songs. And uh, there'll be a great resource for you after this course today. So I always go back to the days when I was in college, and I remember my ornithology professor told us that we were going to be tested on bird songs on the final exam, and we had to learn 64 different bird songs. So this is the beginning of the technique that I learned on how to identify and recognize bird songs. And it kind of happened by accident that I developed this, but I actually took his challenge seriously. And I went in and really memorized those 64 different bird songs. And those bird songs became what I call the foundation. And it's almost like putting 64 spokes on a bicycle wheel. So by literally going into the classroom and listening to all these tapes every day, I was repeatedly studying them. Then I was going out in the field and hearing those same birds out in the real world. And I really got to learn all of those songs. And then one day I was out in the field and I heard a song that I'd been hearing all along.
And I said, I recognize that one. That's a red-eyed vireo. So that was one of the songs that I heard while I was in the lab. Now, about a week later, I was in the same area and I heard another song. And I said, what's that? So I listened to this bird and I said, it sounds like a red-eyed vireo, but it's different because, and then I tried to describe why it was different. And I kind of described how the voice was a little bit more huskier and rough edged. And then the bird came out in the open and I realized that it was a yellow throated vireo. Now, what I had done by a process of association, I had said, that sounds like one of my 64 species. It sounds like one of my 64 spokes on the wheel, but it's different for some reason. And by a process of association, I added a new spoke to my wheel. And now I knew 65 different bird species. And this process I've been repeating again and again and again over the last 43 years. Now, when you do this, as you hear each new bird song and you compare it to something you already know, and then you ask, well, how is that different from something I already know? By that process of association, you can begin to learn your bird songs as well. And multimedia programs are really great for doing this. So here's um, some examples of how we can uh, take a variation of this process of association and find opportunities to note similarities and the differences between similar sounding species. And this is a very effective way to learn bird songs. So in the example on this page, well, you start with the bird that's underlined, and then you compare it to the other species listed alongside of it to note the differences in sound between the species listed. So we're, we're gonna do the ones, twos, and minis. So we'll focus on that one. And for this one, we're gonna learn how to tell the catbird, the thrasher, and the northern mockingbird about um, from one another. And we'll start with the gray catbird. This is a bird that takes one note, sings it one time, then takes a different note, sings that one time, then changes again to a different note and sings that one time. So uh, here's a multimedia program that I actually developed years ago. We'll listen to the song here. Then we have the brown thrashers. The brown thrasher is the twos. It takes a note and sings it twice. It goes to a different note, sings that twice then chooses another note and sings that twice. And finally, we have the Northern Mockingbird, which takes a single note and sings it five or six times, goes to a different note and sings that five or six times and so forth. All right, so once you kind of get the repetitive nature of these birds down, um, you can then move on to other birds that have a kind of repetitive nature as well. For example, you could be looking at the Peter, Peter, Peter birds like the tufted titmouse in the east. Or you could be looking at the ask answer vireos. The first one example that we have here would be the blue headed vireo. It sounds like that bird is saying, is that you? Oh yeah. And then the bells vireo is another one, which also sounds like it asks a question and then answers it. 
So those are some examples of how we can start looking at process of association. All right, so to kind of end this presentation, what I, I'm gonna give you some homework assignments. And what I would recommend is basically identifying a geographic region of interest. Um, it could be, for many of you, this will be in and around the place where you live. And then you're gonna collect a set of 20 bird song recordings from that area. Now you can use multimedia CDs, you can use digital audio discs, you can use online websites. There's so many of them now where you can find these bird songs. And you're gonna find 20 bird songs um, that you have an interest in learning. Then you play one at random and you attempt to identify the species. This is a great exercise, by the way, that you can actually do on Zoom. <laughs> So you could actually do this with a friend, even if your friend is all the way over on the other side of the country, you can help each other learn bird songs. You repeat these two steps in boldface over and over again. And as you begin to get better at identifying your birds, don't forget to stop and write down and describe what it is that you hear and create a system for recognizing that song in the future. That system could be a mnemonic, uh, it could be a sonogram that you, you, you can actually create your own sonograms that, that kind of reflect how you hear that bird, or you can download sonograms from the web, or you can even relate the sound that you're hearing to a scene from a favorite movie. So there's so many ways to actually do this. Now, if you're having trouble getting started with identifying those 20 species, um, you'll be able to uh, take this type of a list here which uh, I recommend for starting out and identifying those 20 species, and then you could go from there. So um, I'll leave this up here on the screen for just a second here uh, so that you can see it. Um, now we'll have some time for questions at the very end of the presentation. And for those of you who want to be able to get in touch with me, I'll have my contact information at the end of this, but I really want to thank you for your time and attention today. And that is my presentation. Thanks so much, John. Uh, yes, again, we will definitely get to all the Q&A, um, all the questions and answers during the Q&A portion at the end. Um, Jim Giacomo is up next. And as he gets set up, friendly reminder that we are recording this webinar. So don't worry if you can't copy down all of that information or are having tech problems. We're gonna have the recording available on our YouTube site, as well as an email sent out to registrants, along with all of the links to resources and more. So up next is Jim. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, like Jordan mentioned, my name is Jim Giacomo. I am the Central Region Director for American Bird Conservancy which means that I cover the area from Texas to Northern Canada or my little 1% of the earth. And uh, I live in Northern Illinois right now, about four miles south of the Wisconsin border. And today I'm gonna to talk about the landscape of songbird conservation, how sound helps conservationists and what you can do to keep these birds singing. So while John talked about the how of learning bird songs, I'm gonna talk more about the why and uh, I'm going to mention uh, a little bit about bird song and, and large scale bird uh, monitoring and ways you can contribute to bird conservation by learning your bird song and then a, a few tools for learning song ID. So the first thing I want to talk about is the, is the breeding bird survey, which is a, a huge effort by uh, citizen scientists across North America who go out every summer and do bird counts. Each one of those red dots represents a route on the breeding bird survey to uh, the volunteers go out and count birds in one morning. Um, they do uh, 3,700 routes nationally uh, and about 2,900 of them are conducted annually uh, between May and June during the breeding season. Uh, it's a 24 and a half mile transect. They stop 50 times and listen for three minutes and, and, and uh, look around and try to identify birds. And these are all on roads and 80% of the detections are by song alone. So uh, these folks need to know all of their bird songs for that region to be able to, to conduct the survey and, and collect the data consistently. 
And so this is the basis for, uh, provides the basis for a lot of the con large scale conservation that we do. We can, from, from this data, we can estimate population sizes and, and, and the world population and how much of the population is within a region of interest. This happens to be for the, the Oaks and Prairies region of Texas and Oklahoma. And these routes are sampling, you know, in that, that 60 million acre area, they're sampling less than 1% of the area. And from that, and knowing bird songs, we can extrapolate what are the populations, what are they doing, and how well are they doing? And, and this is where we get the information of, of different bird populations. I happen to work on a lot of grassland birds that are declining and we are addressing their conservation needs and how we know how much they're declining and which ones we really need to work on is from, from the breeding bird survey. So if your retirement account looked like some of these graphs, you would not be happy, but uh, converting the, the percent declines that are showing for each of these species to how much they've declined since 1966 in the Oaks and Prairies region. Uh, you see some of the birds have, have declined by more than 90%. Uh, and um, that's why we're addressing their conservation needs right now. But we wouldn't know that if there weren't these volunteers going out and doing these annual bird counts. And the breeding bird survey, along with the Audubon Christmas bird count for a long time, were the only way, only two times of the year that we would know something about bird populations. and uh, we could extract uh, information to, to do conservation. But uh, the problem with that is, is only having a snapshot in the winter and in the breeding uh, time period, uh, we're missing things happening as, as birds migrate and move around and expand their ranges and, and do all kinds of other things and, and uh, uh, you know, our, exist in habitats that are away from roadsides. Uh, there's uh, for a long time, we wanted more information, and uh, about a decade, a little over a decade ago, eBird came along. Cornell uh, Lab of Ornithology put together eBird, which everyone could use uh, to log in. Uh, you, you set up an account, and you can enter in your bird observations, and uh, it'll pull up a checklist, and you can enter in, you know, which species you are seeing or hearing, and then you can submit it and you don't need to know all your birds. You could say, uh, are you submitting a complete checklist of your birds? You could say no if you don't know all your birds and still submit uh, very useful data for uh, uh, bird conservation. And so this, these are my stats so far of, of the birds that I've entered into eBird and how many species and how much per year, which is great for a lister if you're, if you're interested in, in you know, keeping track of, of how many you have per county, you can get down to that level. Um, you could also find a whole bunch of information about different birds. You can explore the data. And the websites I'm talking about are at the bottom of each of these pages. Um, this happens to be one of my favorite birds, the Henslow Sparrow, and you get different pictures of the Henslow Sparrow. You can scroll down and see the, the map of eBird observations, and you can you can check for monthly eBird observations. So if, depending on where you live, you might be able to see them at different times of the year and the map will show you, okay, in December, the bird is here and you might be able to find it if you're in the right habitats. But they've also been adding, uh, these sonograms are available for a lot of species and videos and, and photos to help with the bird ID. And you can see, see what the sound uh, looks like in a sonogram at, while you're listening to it. And then the, the part I, I uh, actually spend a lot more time with is there's an eBird science page, uh, 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 clicking on the science part. And this is where, instead of just having a snapshot of the breeding season and the, and the wintering season, uh, starting to put together the eBird data at different times of the year to look at how it moves from January to December. So we could see the full annual cycle for the different species. That one was Henslow Sparrow. And then a neotropical migrant or a, a bird that winters south of basically Southern United States and Mexico. The wood thrush, you could see starting in January, going to December and then moving back down. I could watch these all day. This is fun to uh, sit here and watch. I'll play it one more time. And they've got these maps for, for a lot of species now, and it's, it's expanding to uh, um, 
worldwide as they collect more data. So it's a good time to be a birder. And more recently, they released a new Merlin app through uh, uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology for, for bird ID help. And, and you can go in and log into this, it's, it's free. And it'll identify bird songs and calls that you, you can uh, record through your phone. And you can identify birds in, in, a, in a photo. I haven't played with that one yet, but uh, these are kind of new things that are coming out that are available through the Merlin app. And finally, uh, kind of with all of this information and with, with uh, caring about birds as we do, uh, given that you're on a, a afternoon webinar to talk about birds, uh, there are uh, ways that you can help around your house that, that uh, uh, can help the birds out. And there are, are seven actions that you can take to help bring back birds, including uh, window safety, keep your, your cats indoors, uh, re reducing planting of non-native species, avoiding pesticides, drink bird-friendly coffee, protect the planet from plastics, and the last one is watch and share, uh, watch birds and share what you see. And that's what I would encourage you. Uh, ornithology has a long history of, of citizens, citizen science uh, contributing to the, the uh, scientific uh, information that we build upon to do our conservation work. And even if you don't know all your birds, but you're starting to learn some of your birds and some of your bird songs, you can participate in, in eBird. And I highly encourage that. If you want to learn more information about that, I wanted to throw in their ABC's uh, website about uh, the three billion bird loss and all the information about that that comes from the Breeding Bird Survey and, and the, the other uh, surveys that I talked about. And I always like to end my talks with uh, baby birds because that's what I do. I monitor nesting success. So this is one of my recent uh, strike nest visits from last year. And what great sounds do they have? <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Uh, we're now going to move into uh, everyone's usual favorite portion of the webinar, which is our Q&A. We're gonna start with some of the most common questions that came in during the registration period, and then we'll move into some of the ones that came in during the live portion. So we're gonna start things off by going back to John with this question. Um, and so, going back to this feeling of there's so much to learn, right? And sometimes birds don't cooperate. You can't hit the pause button or tell them to stay still. So do you have any recommendations on technology, apps, gear that folks could actually record songs in the field for themselves and then have it to review and learn from uh, once they get home? Um, I don't have any recommendations, but what I can tell you is that uh, being a teacher, a lifelong teacher, I've been training people for decades. What I have found is that everyone has their own way, their own style of learning. So you almost have to go out and find the gear or the app that fits your style of learning. Uh, but literally, if, if you go to online websites, um, if you search for um, how to record bird songs. You could go to Google, how to record bird songs. There's amazingly a number of websites that'll come up and tell you the gear that you need to go out and buy. So then you just kind of figure out, well, which one do you, which one would I be most attracted to? And there's, there's a lot of good websites out there. Um, so I would just look at all the, there's just a plethora of online resources now um, there's still a lot of uh, multimedia CDs from the 1990s. They're still available. Digital audio CDs that are all over Amazon. So there's, there's many places where you could go to get that. Thanks, John. Uh, so Jim, the next question is for you and continuing the sense of overwhelmed feeling. Um, so we're out birding, we're gonna be citizen science and uh, contribute all of this data but there's so many birds singing at the same time. Um, so I wanna go to how do you sift through the different songs, but for you, Jim, how do you know that you're not over counting how many singers there are or under counting, right? So how do you know that you have 
uh, one song sparrow compared to five? Do you have any tips for, for folks on how to, how to tell those apart? Yeah, uh, I mean, that's, that's the difference between using eBird where you can, you can kind of, uh, you know, count the ones that you know you know are there versus the breeding bird survey where you definitely have to uh, try not to double count. And it, uh, depending on where your skills are, you'll get to the point where you can tell that uh, there's, a, there's a bird over there and it's 10 meters away and there's a bird over there and it's 50 meters away. And, and, and that's kind of the job part of, of, of what we do to, to count birds. And then there's the, the uh, 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 kind of the eBird side where you, you hear a cardinal singing over there and you see a cardinal over there and uh, there's at least two and that's good enough. And you can uh, not worry about it too much, not worry about double counting too much, but the double counting comes in for the statistical methods. Thanks, Jim. So maybe you wanna follow up or John, you can chime in. How do you personally, or do you have any tips on how to separate out all of those songs that you hear simultaneously? Do you have any good ways to help your ears pinpoint yeah exactly and yeah. yeah there is a there is a slide that i usually have in my presentations but for time purposes i i had to take it out um part of it though is the directionality of it um we were talking about oven birds earlier on and when you're out in the middle of the woods you can hear that teacher 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 from the east but you can also hear another one further out in the west and you know you have two different birds but then to your question, what if there's wood thrushes and pine warblers and American robins and everything else is singing at the same time? And so the slide that I usually have in my presentation is everyone remembers Smoke on the Water by Deep Purple. Everyone knows that song. It's been around for ages. I always challenge people to listen to that song and listen for the bass guitar. That means you got to sift through the lead vocals you got to sift through John Lord's organ. You got to sift through the lead guitar with Richie Blackmore. And you got to find that bass guitar. And when you start hearing the bass guitar, it's amazing how wonderful the bass sounds. Most people don't even hear it. <laughs> but when you start practicing like that, you're going to do the same thing out in the spring. You're, you're, you're going to hear a bird and you just have to like focus all the other things out and just focus on that one bird. And, and so that exercise will get you to the point where now you can just, just focus in on that one bird that you hear and tune all the other birds out. Wonderful, thanks, John. So moving on to the list of questions, and if I ever seem to look off, I'm looking at my other screen. Thank you so much to our super engaged audience for participating. Um, so the next thing is actually going back to separating out what is a song versus a call versus a call note or night calls. There seem to be a lot of sounds coming from individual birds. Um, and so John, this question was directed for you in terms of does, does that seasonality uh, define these different types of sounds or is there more to it? Well, I think you'll find that calls can be given 365 days a year by any bird. Um, the songs are going to be a more concentrated, uh, usually during the breeding season, uh, or for purposes of uh, attracting a mate, defending a territory, or so forth. Um, but also, as I mentioned in my presentation, um, some birds respond to that bright sun in the middle of the winter. And uh, white-throated sparrows, I always remember them. I just, every year, southern Illinois, going out in the middle of the winter and those birds are singing, but usually on bright sunny days in, in the winter. So they're kind of responding to that sunlight. Um, at night, many birds migrate at night. Those, those call notes that you hear are calls. They're, they just have a little single call note or two that you hear up there, but it's not a song that we would normally yeah, talk about. Thanks. So. Talking about singing in the winter is a great lead into our next question. And Jim, maybe you can uh, answer it first. But so there has been snow across Canada just yesterday. Um, and yet American robins and other migrants have returned. So the question is, how does weather actually impact singing? 
Um, is singing uh, strenuous? Is it energy intensive for birds? Does the snow and cold weather reduce it or impact their breeding? Um, Jim, again, maybe you want to talk about how weather impacts singing. Sure. Uh, everything a bird does, do, it, it takes energy and, and singing is one of them. And especially if they're singing on territory, they're doing that for a reason to keep, to, to kind of mark where their, their, their property lines are and where uh, they want to keep other uh, pairs, other males out of the, the area so they can have a nice breeding territory. So they're going to spend energy singing and defending uh, territories as they're setting up. The weather will will uh, affect the you know energy use because they got to they got to stay warm too. So um, you don't want to play calls when when in in the breeding season and and uh, make them expend energy to defend a, a bird that isn't there. So. That's why it's definitely recommended not to play, you know, calls off your phone that you can get easily during the breeding season because they need all the energy they can get to, to, to do what they need to do on the breeding season and then either, uh, you know, find a place to, to winter or migrate south and then find a place to winter and, and they live right on the edge of, of, of uh, uh, survival with, with energy and, and sometimes, you know, in the worst conditions, in the weather conditions, if you're if you're uh, affecting their their singing rate, uh, um, you can do some damage to the individuals and the population. Thanks, Jim. And you actually touched on another topic of interest, a slightly more controversial one, which is the issue of playback. Um, so, for those of you watching that aren't familiar, playback is when you actually play a bird's song intentionally to try and get a response from a bird. Um, and so there's obviously ethical pros and cons to this. And so Jim, and then especially John too, if you wanna make a comment about playback, that'd be great. Yeah, like I said, it, it costs energy to sing. And if you're, if you're causing them to expend energy in the wrong times at the wrong place, uh, uh, you know, you, you can affect the individual and its, survive, its ability to reproduce and survive. So, uh, I, I don't use calls. I'll, I'll do some fishing in the winter. Um, and that's about it. Yeah, same here. I don't use that other than going owling for Christmas bird count. Um, that's usually about the only time that I'll use a play playback. Um, I know that when I lived in Southern Illinois, there was a bird, I'm not gonna mention the name of the bird, but I know what it was. And it was down in Southern Illinois. And it was one of these birds that gets into thick brush and it was quite rare. And everybody wanted to go to the same place, play the song and try to get it to come out. And at some point that bird is thinking, gosh, there's so many males here in my territory, I, I better leave. And at some point that bird just stopped going there. So it can have very um, adverse effect and an impact on rare and in, in the, the endangered species. So that's why I don't do it. Yeah, I, I definitely would encourage everyone to always put the bird's well-being first and whatever you do, however you enjoy nature. Um, so moving on, um, sorry, I lost my, my question. Um, we're going to now ask you about, uh, oh, so, okay, take a widespread ranging species, again, like American Robin. Do birds of the same species have dialects or special lingo or other things that we notice, um, accents, uh, things that we notice when humans speak. Um, the question is asking both about do the same birds always sound the same um, or do they vary? So John, maybe you wanna take, take that one. Yeah, one of the most uh, intensely studied birds around that would be the white crowned sparrow. Uh, they've done a lot of research on that one. And there's a lot of dialects out there, uh, but you can even take something like a field sparrow and you'll find a field sparrow in the Midwest. You hear the field sparrow on the East Coast in Maryland or somewhere, They're, they sound a little bit different. And, uh, and so there are dialects and and the more you travel, the more you're gonna find just how common this is. 
And so what you're doing now to identify these birds is you're looking for the patterns, the cadence, um, things like that. That's what's gonna really, really help you. Um, you'll find that if you recognize certain patterns that birds have, then that'll make it easier. Another bird that is really interesting is the Eastern towhee. Everyone remembers it as drink your tea, drink your tea. Well, there are some birds that go tea, drink your, and there's other birds that go your tea, drink, and they, they mix it all up. And so that's what I mean again, is that it's not so much a dialect, it's just individual variation and you're looking for the cadences and the patterns. And then that's what help you to ID that bird. One last thing is my favorite. I always call it the rotary phone bird. If you're under 50, you probably don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but that's the Buick's wren. Go out and play the Buick's wren and it sounds like someone dialing a rotary phone from the 60s or 70s. And uh, a lot of people have trouble identifying the song of the Buick's wren. But once you realize it sounds like someone just dialing a phone, you got it. Makes it so simple now. Thanks for the tip. So the follow-up question is for Jim. So your video at the end of the Shrikes inspired this, and that is about uh, the difference in sounds between adult birds and chicks. And what do you call the sounds that chicks make? And are songs taught or learned or just happen? <laughs> so if you could speak to that, that would be great. Sure. Uh most of what the, the young birds are doing from the nest would be considered calls. And, and there's, different, there's different reasons for, for communicating from, from the nest. Uh, you know, they're begging for food and, and it's, it's short communications that, that uh, yeah, you'll hear the female do a, a chip or something like that and it'll shut them off right away if, if, you know, if a predator is close or, or a researcher in my case is close. Uh, and so, uh, Almost everything that they do from the nest would be a call because they do have to learn the song. Uh, what I know about bird uh, song learning is that uh, usually the, the birds have the notes in their head, but they don't necessarily have the order in their head. And it, 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 the, the, the way that they're, they're kind of set up to learn songs, it happens at a certain time in their development and they're able to learn the song from their parents, which is why they have different dialects because different populations kind of shift some of those uh, uh, you know, pieces around. But they, they have the pieces in their head, they just uh, um, have to learn the right order usually. And, and that may explain what John was talking about the, the, uh, uh, with the toe -y. John, you wanna add anything to the song learning? Yeah, yeah. Um, the more you study this, the, mo the more you are impressed by what nature will offer you in return. <laughs> and I remember I, uh, when I lived in Tennessee, I actually took a day to just focus on two, two species. The yellow warbler, sweet, 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 I'm so sweet. And the chestnut-sided warbler, please, please, please to meet ya. All right. And Sometimes those birds can kind of vary to the point where they sound so similar. So I just took a day to just focus on those two. And I went from place to place and I got out of my car and I was listening to them and trying to identify them before I got a visual on them. I got to one area in Western Tennessee and I heard that, please, please, please to meet you. And I thought, well, there's another chestnut sided warbler. When I finally got on the bird and looked at it, I was so surprised. It was a male cerulean warbler singing a spot on chestnut sided warbler. Never seen it before, never seen it since, but at some point that young, that young bird might've been around the chestnut sided and learned that song. Uh, but I was just, I was uh, blown away by that one. So you really have to ask, where did a cerulean warbler learn that song? That's amazing. Wow. Um, I, sorry, that's just amazing. So moving on, 
Uh, we had a question come in about noise and the impact of noise pollution on bird songs. Um, uh, there was also a reference to changes in noise that were accounted for during the pandemic. Some places got a lot quieter and, and now we're getting louder. So how are the birds responding? Um, and any other comments in terms of if that's okay? Or I know Carolina Wrens are one of the loudest singers. Do they just sing louder? Um, again, Jim, why don't you take that one first? Sure. Um, they are finding that, that uh, you know, background noise does affect birds and, and where they'll put territories. And, and it, it, they do sing louder where they need to, to, to you know, kind of balance out the, the being able to attract a mate and having a good place to, to, to raise young. Uh, um, you know, it might be a good place to raise young where it's really loud. And if they can't attract a mate, they won't use that area, uh, but it'll be kind of an attractive area because it looks good. So it'll turn into a, a population sink and, and contribute to, to some of the declines of birds. Uh, there's, there's lots of different research looking at that, and especially with, with the, uh, um, the COVID impacts of, on, on human populations moving around. It's going to be interesting to see some of the research that, that people I know have been working on to, to look at how uh, noise level changes in, in, in affected bird populations. I haven't seen anything yet, but, but I know that urbanization and, and residential areas that, that are getting louder and louder as, as more people are moving around are, are affecting the local bird populations. Yeah, so I, would, I would agree with the, everything that he said on that one. Thanks, Ron. Um, so, Song is one of the most obvious attractants, right? It's all about breeding. We keep saying about the breeding season and, and song is a way of communicating for that. So one of the things that folks were hoping that we would touch on is duetting. Um, and so John, I don't know if you wanna to speak to all of the new research that's coming out about female song that has been overlooked for a long time. A lot more female birds sing than originally were thought. And then also, Duetting and how does that play into learning songs? Are they considered one song? Are they different songs? Yeah, I think with the female birds that sing, um, there there was probably a time when we thought it was kind of rare, but we're finding now that it's actually more common than we thought. And I think that's just because of the natural way that research develops. We get more data and we find out more things. Um, the Duetting um, practice is you typically find that with birds that live in very thick habitats. And it's part of a way of them just keeping in touch with one another. It's like, you know, if you have a young child and you go to the mall, you don't want that child to get too far away from you. You might not find your child again. And so when, when you hear birds doing that, a lot of times it's just a way for them to keep in touch with with one another when they're in very, very thick brush. Um, so that's one example of where the duetting comes in to uh, play. Thanks. So going back to Jim and actually an earlier question about how do I know that I'm either identifying this for myself correctly or for say eBird, mimics. How do you actually know when a bird that is a mimic, so a Northern Mockingbird, is what it is? <laughs> so do you have any tips on that? And then uh, another person asked, do mimics have their own song as well? <laughs> so, <laughs> so Jim, how about you start? Well, that's a good question. Well, there are the, the, the uh, mimics that, that John talked about a little bit, the Northern Mockingbird and the Brown Thrasher and, and the uh, 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 Great Catbird. And the Great Catbird has its meow that's separate from other birds. So I guess it has its own song. Uh, mockingbird, you know, I came from Texas where mockingbirds were everywhere and they had all different songs all over the place. So uh, probably not a mockingbird, but even like blue jays will mimic uh, hawks. And so um, they're not called a mimic, but but they're 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 mimicking stuff. And then they have their own calls and songs. So, or if you want to call a blue jay's call a song, uh, it, it, 
I, I guess it's more human semantics and words than it is something about the birds, but uh, uh, the true mimic, like the mockingbird, I don't know if it has its own song. Uh, John, you want to <laughs> speculate on that? Yeah, so let me touch on all those points that you just raised. So uh, jays, uh, blue jay, stellar's jay, scrub jay, it's interesting, all these jays like to try, and I'm using the word try, they like to try to mimic a hawk. And, and I say that with a smile on my face because as hard as they try, you can still see right through it. I mean, I've been in the woods and I'll hear that, that, we, that little wimpy red-tailed hawk call and I'll go, oh, that's a red, no, that's a jay imitating a red tail. Um, they, they try, but they just don't get it truly right. So I think the jays don't do it 100%. Now the mockingbirds, they're more skilled. They, they really are good. And if you listen to a mockingbird, you'll hear it do a nuthatch, a jay, a robin. You'll hear it mimic all the birds in this area. But remember what I said, they take one note, they repeat it five or six times, and then they go to a different note. A nuthatch sings a nuthatch song all day. So when you, when you start hearing the, that, that sound changing and it's coming from the same direction and then it changes again, that's a telltale sign that it's a mimic and not the real bird. So yeah, that's one way to tell. Yeah, we have had uh, mockingbirds that learn Bob White calls, but they'd be sitting up high in a tree and you go, <laughs> what's that Bob White? Wait, that's not a Bob White in the tree. That's a mockingbird messing with us. So. Uh, it also, location helps. Oh, yeah. Now, see, he's, he's bringing more ideas. So here's another one. Kip, kip, kip. Kip, kip, kip. There's actually two birds that do that. There's the winter wren. And you're going to find that down in the woods, down in the stream, down in the low brush. But you're also going to hear that same cadence from a red crossbill flying far overhead. So when you hear kip, 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 and it's way up in the sky, you know that's a red crossbill. And when you hear it down in the ground, it can't be a crossbill, that's gonna be a winter wren. So that's another one where those two birds almost sound alike when they give that call, but it comes from two completely different hab habitats. Time is quickly running out, so I just have a few more questions before we wrap up. Um, I can't help but choose some of the more fun personal ones, which are, do you have a favorite bird sound, and is there a bird sound you'd really like to hear that you haven't? So, John, do you want to go first? A favorite bird song, is that right? <laughs> Uh, actually, I do. Um, my favorite bird song is uh, Bachman Sparrow. Can I share, share my screen? Absolutely. Okay, yeah, so we'll do that one. And um, there we go. All right, so here's the Bachman Sparrow. Let's play that song. So that's the Bachman Sparrow, and that has definitely my all-time favorite bird song. I think it's one of the most beautiful songs in, in the world. That is lovely. Jim, do you have a song that you love or would like to hear? Well, uh, I worked with Bachman Sparrows, and that's one of my favorites, but uh, I also worked with Henslow Sparrows, and, and, and they just have a, a silic kind of sound to them that... Um, it's, it's barely a, a song, it's, it's, it's more like a call, but they will do it at night as well as during the day. So it's, it's kind of interesting that they'll sing at night. We don't know why. And with the few minutes that remain, I'm gonna ask you both, what is one thing that you hope folks take away from this webinar and share with a friend? So John, why don't you go first? Um. A couple things. So number one, I want to remind everyone that the more songs you learn, the easier it becomes to learn more songs. <laughs> okay, so don't be intimidated by the process. 
but the one thing that I want people to take away is this process of association idea and the homework assignment that I gave them, which is to choose 20 species, focus on those, build your bicycle wheel of 20 spokes, and then go out and find that 21st and identify it by, com by comparing it to the 20 that you already know and rationalize, well, how is it different than the ones that I al already know? Wonderful, and Jim? Yeah, all I can say is this is a great time to be a beginning birder. There's lots of you know, tools you can use on your phone and, and, and eBird is a great way to keep track of, of your progress as you're going. So check out eBird and, and just get out there and go birding. Thank you both. Thank you, John and Jim, for being with us here today and presenting. With that, we'll end the webinar. Thank you to all of our audience members for joining us. We truly couldn't do our work and help birds without your support. Please consider making a gift today to help us in protecting songbirds and their habitats this spring and beyond. I hope you all enjoy a dawn chorus and singing birds soon. Thank you so much again. Thanks, everyone.